Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, and in case I forget, good evening to all truth seekers, spiritual people, and lovely souls. This presentation is about the long-awaited review of the movie called The Fountain by Darren Aronofsky that came out in 2006. We chose this movie for our movie day because it is one of the most deeply spiritual and esoteric movies of all time. Besides being a beautiful romantic love story, it deals with so many spiritual truths and concepts. It is indeed a must watch and covers so many philosophical and religious subjects. It explores the themes of life death, love and loss. There are aspects of Kabbalism in the film and looks at the tree of life in a visually stunning way. But there are also elements of Hermitism, Buddhism, Theosophy, Alchemy and Catholicism. All can be seen in The Fountain. It also deals with the subject of time and how the past, the present and the future are actually fluid and that all time is happening at the same moment. It is also a science fiction film and predicts our distant future. An accurate portrayal of the Spanish Inquisition and Spanish colonization of South America is also touched on. The Fountain is a cinematic masterpiece that has withstood the test of time. It is visually stunning and emotionally moving. In this video, we take a closer look at The Fountain and examine the themes and motifs that make it such a timeless classic. From the stunning visuals to the haunting soundtrack, we explore the many layers of meaning that are woven into this masterpiece of cinema. So, enjoy! Yeah, it's a very sad movie. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to do an introduction, a little introduction, and then we'll watch the movie, okay? Yeah, please uh, don't be shy. Please get something to eat while we're watching the movie. That's fine. So, once in a blue moon, uh, you get a movie that comes along that's exceptional. That's really a beautiful movie. And uh, this is one of them, The Fountain. For some reason, it didn't do very well at the movie house. And uh, it's got to do with the confusion people experienced. Because there are three stories in one. Three timelines uh, in one. And that's what made it a bit difficult. But it should have got much more uh, credit. You know, you must give credit where credit is due. 
Um, it became a cult following afterwards, you know, it got a lot of people that followed the movie afterwards. Also, The Fountain is not a movie that you can watch once. You have to watch it again and again. I watch it at least once a year. It's like a meditation. The Fountain's like a meditation. And every time you watch it, you'll get something, something out of it. I've got the DVD here, and I'm going to leave it here. So we'll have like a library if you want. If you want to watch the DVD at home, you know, you're more than welcome to take the DVD and watch it. But it is available on, I don't know if it's, a, yeah, it's available on Apple. And, um, you know, did, by the way, did you know that video shops are going to come back again? Do you know why? They're going to start censoring stuff on the internet. Um, there's going to be much more control, especially with the AI that's coming and the algorithms that Google is pushing out. So even movies are going to be censored in the future. Um, so people are actually going to go back to the old video shop and get DVDs from their, from their DVD shops. Uh, so if you've got books and if you've got DVDs, don't throw them away. Hold on to them. Uh, because, you know, something you've got in a solid form, no one can take that away from you. But on the internet, they can take it away, they can manipulate it, they can take things away from an article uh, if they choose to do so. So, what is The Fountain all about? Well, The Fountain deals with and portrays things that are outside of our normal perception. It goes into the subconscious and it goes into higher dimensions. So sometimes your conscious mind gets left behind because it's dealing with things that are above, above the lower mind. We are dealing with things that fall into the realm of higher mind and above. So it's a film that speaks to our unconscious minds and it speaks also to our higher self. And so on that level, there will be a great understanding. So your brain will say, what's going on here? But your subconscious and your higher mind will say, I get it, you get it. So we cannot relate what we are seeing to our normal conscious lives. The only thing that you can relate to it, that you can anchor onto and attach yourself to is the doctor, Dr. Tom. And he struggled to find a cure uh, so that he can save his wife because she has a brain tumor. And so his whole goal in life is to find a cure to save his wife. That you can anchor yourself to. So the overall message is that death is a natural part of life. Death is a natural part of life. The language of film taps into your psyche. This film, it taps into your psyche. We do not always understand what we see. We may attempt to create our own meaning as a representation of our lives. We often want to relive an aspect of our lives through film. So at its heart, The Fountain is a love story. Uh, to a degree, the entire film is a love story about loss and the accepting death as a natural part of life. Like the film, life is a dream. And like the film, time is not linear. This question, this film makes you uh, explore and question what time is. That's the one thing about this film. Uh, time is an illusion. Time is not what we think it is. All right? So the past, the present and the future are all one. And they're all playing out at the same time. Um, things in the future are happening right now. Things in the past are happening right now. Um, it's not like it's, it's uh, solid in some time frame. These things are fluid and they're happening all the time. So all things are happening at the same time. You'll see a lot of circles in this movie, a lot of spheres because the sphere is a symbol of time. Time is circular. Like the film, the past, the present and the future are all one. So the overall theme of the movie is death. It's speaking about death and it's speaking about love. 
So what is love and what is death? These concepts are very difficult to put into words. So the movie makes use of sound, music, the art of cinema to portray these aspects of love and death. It expresses these concepts through visual art and brings death and love together in an explosion of ecstasy in the climatic ending. It shows us that from destruction comes creation, which in turn brings life and love. Now, what's interesting about this concept that creation comes out of destruction, um, there's a negative side to that as well, all right? Uh, the, the dictators of the world love that idea. <laughs> yeah, look, we must kill everything, destroy everything, we're going to build again. Okay? But that's forced, that's forcing nature, that's forcing evolution to do what you want it to do. If death comes naturally, then it is beautiful and it's acceptable. But if people force it, that's when it becomes evil and unnatural. So yes, in a natural sense, uh, creation comes from destruction. So the question is, why do we have to die? Everybody wants to live forever. Death should not be feared, but welcomed. The fountain is not so much a puzzle as it is a prayer, a journey, a meditation. The film is about you and your journey through life. So life is cyclical, just like time is cyclical, life is also cyclical. We are in a cycle of life. Um, remember that movie, The Lion King? Uh, the lion said to the, the warthog, I think, or uh, that other little funny creature, that life, life is a circle. Life is a circle. And they were laughing at him and they said, no, no, life is a straight line. You start here and you end there and that's it, you know. But life is a cycle. We go through death we go, and we come back again only to die again because life is a cycle. We die only to be born and only to die again. The universe loops in on itself. Death is an act of creation. So Tom is the last man but he's also the first man. He's the first father. Okay? Um, and the, this term first father is a Mayan term. This movie teaches you a lot about Mayan religion, Mayan philosophy as well. And so we'll have a look at that as well. So the overall lesson to learn from this movie is that the time you are in is not that important. But the experiences you learn in life, that is what's important. It doesn't matter if you're riding a horse carriage, uh, a chariot, it doesn't matter if you're riding a car. It doesn't matter if you're riding a spaceship. It doesn't matter what time period you're in. What does matter is are you learning the lessons that the universe is teaching you. That's what's important. The first father. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler. Okay, this is a spoiler, but I'm doing it because people don't understand the scene. Uh, so when you see the scene, you'll understand what's going on. So here we have the conquistador, the conquistador, Tom in Central America. He's been sent by the queen to go look for the tree of life, to find the answer to, the, to, to everlasting life. And if you drink or eat of the tree of life, according to the Bible, you will live forever. So he goes on a quest to look for this tree in Central America. And so he finds the tree, okay, and he sticks his knife in it, the sap pulls out, and also before, he, before this thing, he gets stabbed. The guard that's guarding the temple where the tree is, he gets stabbed by this guard. And so when he's at the tree, he takes the sap and he rubs it onto his wound, okay. But instead of living forever, what happens? He falls down and it's death by rapid flower growth. These flowers come out of him and he becomes the earth. In, so in other words, he 
becomes nature through his death, through his sacrifice, giving himself to nature, new birth, new growth begins to happen. Okay, so here we have creation out of destruction. So eternal life is not what you think it is. Okay, this is also a very Buddhist idea. The Buddhist idea that eternal life is when, when you die, you go into nature and you become part of nature. You become part of the universe. So there he puts the stuff on his wound and what happens? The flowers come out. And he can't stop it. It's rapid, rapid growth. Flowers growing out of Tom. This is in the Mayans book of creation. This whole story. A god sacrifices himself. And he falls down. And out of his belly comes a tree. And the whole of the universe comes out of his belly. And he was the first father. It's a Mayan principle. Which is very similar to, to Christianity if you think of it. Because in Christianity the same thing happens. Jesus gave his life so that others may live. So out of destruction comes creation. So it's amazing how these concepts in different religions and different cultures are so similar in their understanding. So there are the flowers growing out of Tom. Okay? And he becomes one with nature. Tom dies after drinking the sap uh, of the tree of life. The tree did not extend Tom's life the way he wanted it to. Tom dies when he consumes the tree because Tom has come to terms with the fact that death is the road to all. And he is the first father. He brings life to the world. Tom's life begets more life. Living forever does not necessarily mean what we think it means. Living forever means that you become part of the earth. Your life gives way to new life. Tom becomes first father at the end of the film, a being whose life begets more life. And interesting about the first father, when he becomes first father, is that he's not bound by time anymore. He's a being that can operate in all times. And so you see him appearing in all times. Da come die Glomme uit. Sy mond oral. So, just before we watch the movie, we're just going to talk a bit about the wheel of life. The wheel of life. It's a Buddha understanding of the universe. And this wheel of life comes up in the movie as well. The wheel of becoming is a Buddhist symbol of the process of existence. The wheel is a common shape in Buddhism. So there it is. We have this wheel. What's interesting about this wheel is that it's always turning. It's, a, it's churning all the time, just like the yin-yang symbol. The yin-yang symbol is not a solid, frozen symbol. It's actually two fish. It started with two fish. And these two fish are constantly revolving around each other. So this wheel is constantly turning. Um, and it speaks of the cosmic energy. It's the cosmic energy that makes this wheel turn, samsara. Uh, which is one of the goddesses in Hinduism, but also it is a life energy, the cosmic energy. The endless rotation of Shakti, cosmic energy. So there's a big monster that is gripping this wheel, all right? And that monster, that god, is the god of death and the god of change, of constant change. And so, in the center, this is where everything starts in the center. The whole wheel turns on three aspects, three emotions, three thought patterns. And that is greed, hatred or anger, and ignorance. So from these three, all right, uh, action is born. From our emotions and our thoughts, action comes. From action comes karma. And from karma comes which place in the wheel you are going to be positioned. So that's the wheel, the wheel of life. Three things, desire, hatred, and ignorance. 
Now, in Tom's uh, case, the thing that's driving Tom is desire. All right? His desire, his attachment to his love, the love of his life. And from that, everything else turns. His whole life revolves around that aspect of desire. So in the center of this wheel, we get three animals. Okay? Uh, and it's a snake, it's a bird, and it's a pig. The pig represents ignorance. Because the pig eats anything and, and, and lives in anything. All right? So that's ignorance. To eat anything and live in anywhere is ignorance. The other thing is the snake. The snake is easily aroused, easily provoked. And so the snake lashes out from anger. And that makes the wheel turn. And the other one is this bird, uh, which speaks of desire. In India, they've got a bird that uh, mates with another, with a, the male and female mate, and they stay together for life. They are attached to each other. And so that attachment is symbolized in desire. Desire also has the idea of attachment. So from that now we get the outer circle, the, the next level, the next level. To escape the will has to go, uh, let go of attachment. So if you can get rid of hatred or anger, desire and ignorance, then you can become free of the will. So the, whole, the goal of the whole thing is to let go, let go. That's what Buddhism is all about. Buddhism is teaching you to let go, all right? Let go of desire, let go of anger, let go of attachment, let go of ignorance. Um, at the top of this big wheel, in the left-hand corner, or the right-hand corner in the picture, is the moon. And that symbolizes that you can escape the wheel. And on the other side, the Buddha is pointing a finger at the moon and saying, you can be set free from this wheel. You can be set free from, from the wheel. So past Tom desires eternal life. Present Tom desires to save Izzy from death. And Tom's ignorance and hatred for death is also expressed in the form. So everything stems from those three things. So the second layer is that layer over there, all right? There, you see that one. That is now the level of karma, karma. The second layer speaks of karma. And hopefully this dark side is a bad side, the sad side. And this light side is the good side, the happy side. So we must strive to be on the happy side. So we, we begin animalistic, uh, in ignorance. But as we grow, as we develop, we become uh, enlightened beings at the end. So karma will take you down or karma will pick you up, depending on your actions. Happy and sad. And then the next layer is the six paths of life. The six paths of life which is basically two it's the buddha heaven and the buddha hell and that is dependent on karma where you go so it's those six levels over there and so heaven is this beautiful place but you must be careful because if you spend too much time in a nice place you, you you're, gonna, you're not going to learn your lessons and you get kicked out and you get taken to the lower realms again so in hell, everything is going bad. Uh, it's, there are eight, 18 levels, and hell is not just a, a hot place. Hell is also a cold place. So you can either burn up or you can freeze up. And that's heaven now. And in heaven, uh, it's nice, but be careful because you can be kicked out. So that's the Buddha heaven and hell. One aspect of the hell of Buddhism is these beings that are continually hungry. They have this extreme hunger, so they have big bellies and thin necks because every time they eat, it burns their throat. Um, which is very similar to Christianity because Jesus told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man landed up in hell. And he was thirsty, he was hungry. And so he asked Lazarus, who was in Abraham's bosom, to put the finger, his tip of his finger in water and to quench his thirst because he's thirsty in, in hell. And so it's that whole thing about 
suffering. And then the outer of the wheel is 12, made up of 12 points, which speaks of uh, cause and effect. Uh, this exists because something else exists, and so they link together, and they link into 12 points at the edge of the wheel. And so in the movie, you get this circular thing all the time, this, monst this monstrance shape. Right? This is like the Buddha wheel, the Catholic monstrance. Is like is like the Buddha wheel and you'll find although there are three time periods there's Tom in the past during the Spanish Inquisition there's Tom in the present when he's a doctor and trying to find a cure and there's Tom in the future who is living in a bubble a bubble spaceship a sphere and he's traveling through space okay and uh, what the director's done is, which is quite interesting, is when you're in the future, everything is round. You'll see there's spheres and circles everywhere. When you're in the present, it's rectangular. And so you'll see rectangles all over the place, or squares. When you're in the past, it's triangles. And so you'll see triangles. So that gives you some idea of where you are time-wise, time-wise in the movie. But throughout all of those different times, the circle is always there. And through that, uh, the director is saying the past, the present, and the future are all one. The circle brings everything together. Okay. So I just took some nice pictures of, of the monstrance. Okay. This is the director, a Jewish guy. And uh, his name is Darren... Uh, Darren... Aaron... Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky, um, brilliant guy. I mean, a guy that can put a movie like this together must be brilliant and very creative. He was born in 1969, and he grew up in Brooklyn, little Jewish boy in Brooklyn. It's amazing how much creativity can come out of the streets of Brooklyn, eh? Wow. Because many directors come from Brooklyn. Um, so Aronofsky is a Jewish guy. And that's why you have this very strong Kabbalistic teaching in the movie. He brings out the Kabbalah, the tree of life, very strongly in the movie because he himself is grounded in Kabbalism. Um, the other movies that Aronofsky has made is Noah, Noah and Black Swan. Uh, Noah has the actor Russell Crowe in it. Also a powerful, powerful movie. And very accurate, based on the book of Enoch. Very, very interesting. And Anthony Hopkins, my favorite actor, Anthony Hopkins is in the movie. Another movie he did was Black Swan. Ooh, Black Swan. This goes into the whole MK Ultra thing. Uh, multiple personalities, alter personalities, uh, the splitting of your personality. Wow, it's deep stuff. Psychological thriller. Black Swan. If you haven't seen Black Swan, then, then watch Black Swan. Uh, the actor there is Natalie Portman, and she's the actress in Star Wars. She's Padme Amadala, the wife of Anakin Skywalker. And she dresses up in those beautiful costumes in Star Wars. There she is. So those are two of the movies that, that he did. So Aronofsky explains to us that the main message of the film is that of the acceptance of death which then becomes a movement from darkness to light or from destruction to creation. The two main actors in the movie is Hugh Jackman uh, played, playing Tom. Hugh Jackman, if I'm not mistaken, is an Australian actor. And that guy that acts in Avatar is also an Australian actor. And uh, Nicole Kidman is an Australian actor. I don't know what's happening in Australia, but they're bringing out some wonderful actors. He's the Wolverine guy, you know, in the comics, he's the Wolverine guy. Um, and this is the other, the actress, the one that plays Izzy, uh, his wife, and that's played by Rachel Weiss. So we can start with the three, the three timelines. The movie consists of three different timelines, and the main characters exist in all three of those timelines. Each period is separated by 500 years. <clears throat> so we start in the past, 
The past is all about the Spanish Inquisition as well as their quest to find the tree of life in Central America in the Mayan civilization. So it's 500 years in the past. The conquistador is the soldier who goes to, to New Spain, as the, the Spanish people call it, uh, summoned to go there by Queen Isabella of Spain. So this, this time period deals with Spain and with the, the Mayan civilization. Tom the Conquistador. So this past is all based on a book. It's, uh, it's what is his writing. So you could say that it's not true, it's not real. It's simply a story that is his writing. But whether we make these, these, these differentiations is not, that it, is not really that important. So before Easy dies, she presents Tom with her unfinished book, The Fountain. Uh, sh chapter 12 is not written, and she wants him to finish the book. Okay? And he's very hesitant to finish the book. Because for him, the unfinished book means that Easy won't die. So subconsciously he feels if he finishes the book, then Easy will die. So he stays away from that book about a Spanish conquistador named Thomas given the task to save Queen Isabella and Spain from being conquered by the radical uh, inquisitor. So that's the inquisitor. Um, and he gives that speech about that the body is like a cage and the soul is caught in the cage. Um, just remember, the body is just as important as the soul and the spirit. In religion and Christianity, it's almost as if the spirit and soul have greater importance than the body. But the body is just as important. Um, to look after the body, to value the body, is as important as valuing the spirit and the soul. Our bodies are prisons for our souls, our skin and blood. Death turns all to ash, and thus death frees every soul. But to force death on a person is to go against nature. So according to the Queen, the best way to deliver Spain from bondage is to seek out the tree of life. If the Queen can have eternal life, then the Inquisitor can't kill her. Um, and so she believes the answer is to find this tree. So the present, the present, that is now the present age. Tom Creo is the doctor. Uh, trying to find a cure for his dying wife, Izzy, who has a brain tumor. He's very much in love with his wife and he wants to save his wife. And the way he saves his wife, or tries to save her, is by finding a cure for this uh, tumor that's in her brain. Obsessively searches for a cure for his wife and her brain tumor through experimentation with apes. Eh? So that's Tom Creo. Now everyone in the movie is telling him to, to stop running after the cure and to spend more time with his wife, because his wife's dying. But he's torn between these two things. He doesn't want to spend time with his wife who's dying. He wants to find a cure to save her. So he's torn between these two things. So he loses perspective uh, and doesn't spend time with his dying wife. So his boss He's constantly telling him, spend more time with your wife, she's dying. Accept her death. But he doesn't accept her death. Eh? Izzy, on the other hand, is no longer afraid of death and continually tries to convey her feelings to her husband through stories of the Mayan underworld, Shibalba, and how she wants him to view death as an act of creation. So that's where the Mayan story comes in. And so out there on the roof, she explains to him, what Shibalba is all about and what the Mayan civilization is all about and how it, it touches her deeply, this story, the creation myth of the Mayans. So Tom is very stubborn. Uh, he persistently reminds everyone that he is at work to save Izzy, to find a cure for her. So this paradox eventually traps Tom in a circle of obsession and desperation. He can't get out of it. The future, that's the, the space bubble traveling through space. It's now 500 years in the future. Uh, so 
Tom in the present, Tom Creo, is the very same Tom in the future. He's found the cure uh, to everlasting life. He's found this tree, he eats of this tree, and he's managed to live an immortal life. And so, throughout his life, for the next 500 years, he's still trying to find a cure, and he's still trying to get back to Izzy, the Izzy that is lost. And uh, he makes this spaceship, this bubble spaceship, and he goes to Shibalba because he believes the answer is in Shibalba. Just like Tom, the conquistador of Spain, goes to South America to look for the tree of life, now Tom Creo goes in a spaceship to look for Shibalba, the source of creation. The bubble spaceship houses the tree of life that has given Tom immortality. <clears throat> if he stays close to the tree and eats of the tree, he lives, he lives forever. And so he goes up, 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 up into the sky in his little bubble spaceship. Have you noticed it goes vertically upwards all the time? That's got to do with the Kabbalah tree. We are on a journey going from the bottom Seraphoth, which is a kingdom, and we are going up the Seraphoths, different dimensions, higher dimensions, to the top one, which is crown, and beyond, which is Ein Sof. So it's climbing the tree of life. That's why it's going vertically upwards like that. Oh, interesting that this bubble is, is rotating, and it's rotating anti-clockwise. Uh, the universe moves in an anti-clockwise direction. We all move in a clockwise direction. But the universe moves in an anti-clockwise direction. The solar system moves in an anti-clockwise direction. At Mecca, the Muslims, the Kaaba in the middle, they believe is the center of the solar system. And all the planets revolve anti-clockwise around the Kaaba. And that's why they march. That's why they, they do their meditation in an anti-clockwise direction. Moving upwards all the time the bubble spaceship. This position that he's in, I believe, is it's yoga. It's a yoga position. I know nothing about yoga. I still have to learn that. The intertwining, intertwining stories of these three, all together now, uh, of these three men and their quest for life, all display and support the theme of the fear of death. That's what drives Tom in all three, three timelines, is the fear of death and not willing to accept death. As they quest for immortality and the preservation of life of their true loves, Thomas, the three Tommies, the space traveler, all lose sight of the fact that death is what makes them human. So the question asked in this movie is, is death something unnatural against nature? Is it a disease, like he says? Or is death part of nature, you see? That script in the Bible, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? A time will come in the future when we will overcome death. All right? But that's against Buddhism that teaches that it's eternal. It's the cycle of life. So how do you get to grips with this? Is there a final end to death or will death continue forever? Do you have the answer to that? I don't have the answer to that. Maybe you've got the answer to that. So the three quests. What are the three Toms trying to do? The first Tom in the past wants to save Spain. And he wants to save his queen from the Inquisition. And he's going to do that by finding the tree of life. We will live forever. The queen and him will live forever. You will become my Eve, the queen says. And we will live forever. So Tom, in the present, what is he trying to do? He's trying to find a cure for the wife's brain tumor. Now, the third one is a bit complicated. What is Tom in the future trying to do? Okay. Tom in the future is trying to save Izzy. He's trying to save Izzy. He's trying to be reborn, both him and Izzy. He believes, you see, he went and took the seed of the tree of life. Remember that scene in the, in the snow? And he put the seed on Izzy's grave. So now according to Mayan religion, Izzy is now in the tree. And so if he looks after this tree, there's hope for Izzy, you see. 
So he's taking this tree with Izzy inside. That's why he talks to the tree. He actually talks to the tree because he believes he's talking to Izzy. And they go up to Shibalba because he believes if he gets to Shibalba, he can give eternal life to his dead wife. That's what's going on with the future in the future. He's going to bring newness of life to Izzy. So the seed, the seed is very important and it's a reoccurring motif in the movie. The seed of the tree was planted in Izzy's grave by Tom, the doctor, which fell from the tree of life. There he is burying the seed on Izzy's grave, planting the seed. There he is talking to the tree. And uh, he's very scared because, remember, his wife dies. And at the moment that she's dying, the cure, the cure from the monkey laboratories comes. They found the cure, but he's too late. He's too late to save his wife. She has already died. Now the same thing is playing out again. The tree is almost at Shibalba, almost a, to reach Shibalba. What, what happens? It's, a, it's dying. The tree's dying. So now he's afraid that the same thing's going to happen. It's too late. He can't get to Shibalba in time. And so he pleads the tree, hang out. Just hang in there. Hang in there until we get to Shibalba. Don't worry, he says to the tree. We are almost there. Through that last dark cloud is a dying star. Soon, Shibalba will die, and when it explodes, you will be reborn. You will bloom, and we will live. But he doesn't have to be afraid, because in order for resurrection to take place, death has to happen. The tree has to die. Izzy has to die. And after that, the resurrection happens. Newness of life comes. If there's no death, there's no newness of life. The old life must die so that the new life... So you see the very worried look on his face there. Tom Creer is filled with fear and panic when the tree dies right before they reach the dying star. So there's the three Toms, three Toms from the very the three ages. There's the seed from the tree of life. They planted a seed over his grave. That's what the mind caretaker told Izzy at the museum. They planted a seed over his grave, his father's grave. The seed became a tree. Moses said his father became part of that tree. He grew into the wood, into the bloom. And when a sparrow ate the tree, tree's fruit, his father flew with the bird. Death was his father's road to all. That's mine religion. So Tom is constantly kneeling in front of Izzy. It's a sign of accepting death. In the end, 500 years into the future, after fighting death all this time, he now accepts death. And him kneeling in front of his queen is a, an acceptance of death. He accepts death. It takes Tom hundreds of years to come to term with death. And for us also, to learn the lessons in life, it takes us a long time to learn the lessons. Sometimes we're stubborn and we don't learn the lessons that the universe is trying to teach us. Tom doesn't want to finish the book because he's afraid of death. But when the tree finally dies, centuries in the future, that is when Tom makes the decision to accept and embrace death. And also, Tom finishing Izzy's book is a sign that he's accepted death as well. Chapter 12. The moment he starts writing chapter 12, it's subconsciously saying that he has accepted, accepted death. You see, death and life are simply different sides of the same experience. You cannot have life without death, and you cannot have death without life. Both are important in this world. So the different time periods have different geometric shapes. Each timeline is subliminally dominated by a particular geometric shape. And I've been showing you the shapes as we've been going along. Timeline 1 is triangular in the past. Timeline 2 is rectangular in the present. And timeline 3 is circular in the future. So the director has very cleverly put this into the movie. Yeah, every scene you see with the Queen and with Tom, you see triangles. And remember, because she's in the tree, she becomes the tree when the seed is planted on the grave. So she's, the Queen is the tree and so she makes the shape of a tree. Her dress, you see her dress has got all the gold and roots are on the dress to show that she is Shibalba. She is the tree, she is the dying star. So the triangle is everywhere. 
On her dress, you'll see the triangle upside down on the top part and on the bottom part. So her whole dress is a tree and is a triangle. The throne room, the courtroom, is also tri a triangle if you look at it from this angle. So the pillars make the shape of a triangle. And at the top is always the tree of life, always the queen, always Shibalba is at the top of the triangle in every time period. The tapered pillars. When you look at the tiles on the floor, what do they consist of? Triangles. Triangles. And there's a circle in the middle. The circle binds all timelines together. Now there's black and white because black represents the ignorance of Tom and white represents the acceptance of death of the Queen and of Izzy. That's why it's black and white. So we have triangles all over the place. And like the gentleman at the back said, we have a circle in the middle which ties all together and all is tied to Shibalba. Shibalba is the circle, the circle of enlightenment. And you'll see it all over in the movie the circle that appears. Uh, when we go to the present, we see the circle in the museum. And, and, he's, mar and he's walking anti-clockwise. There's the circle in the middle. The past, the present and the future are all one. That's how he brings the past and present and future together. So here we are with a picture of the temple. And what do we see? We just see triangles all over the place because we're in the past. Uh, there's a triangle in that passage going to the tree of life. I also saw uh, sun symbolism and two pillar symbolism here. The New World Order has the two pillar with the sun in the middle rising. That is a very powerful New World Order symbol. It comes up often in movies. Sun rising between two pillars. And we see it in this movie as well. Now, the first father, Tom becomes the first father, and that's why he transcends time. When he eats of the tree of life, he becomes part of all timelines. That's why we see the first father right here back 500 years in the past. But here again, we have triangles. A triangle shape, and then his body is in the position of a triangle as well. The, the dagger, which is a map, has triangles in it as well. There's the triangle again. Uh, the pouch that holds the ring that the Queen gave him is a triangle, a triangle shape. So subconsciously you are told what, what time period you are in because of the triangles. Do you see the triangle? There it is. With the tree in the center, Shibalba in the center, the Queen in the center at the top, Izzy in the center at the top. The keyhole, there we go, is that, that ramp with the, the top part. This symbolic representation of a body of water in the shape of a trapezoid leading towards the tree of life in the center is what is known as the Saturn keyhole symbol. Another name for it is the Saturn Stargate. And this comes up in a book written by David Talbot called the Saturn Myth the Saturn myth. In this book he talks about a stellar configuration, a planetary configuration called the Saturn Stargate. Talbot claimed in ancient times Saturn had no rings and was closer to the Sun. Saturn was a minor star and that Earth had two suns and therefore a different climate, a perpetual summer. And this is uh, the reason for the Golden Age. The Golden Age came to an end due to cosmic events. The planets were rearranged during the celestial upheaval and Saturn, Venus and Mars aligned and they formed the Saturn Stargate. This alignment of the planets resembles a bridge connecting to Saturn. And the reason why our main hero, the protagonist, Tom, is walking uh, in the river towards the Tree of Life is that he is walking on the ramp or the bridge, the bridge to heaven, to the Saturn star, which is a portal to another world. And that's exactly what happens to him in this movie. He is transported in a portal to another place, the place beyond this place, the 
the Saturn portal is actually sort of an, an escape, the portal of escape out of the 3D realm. So the Saturn Stargate is a celestial alignment that causes a portal or a stargate to open in the skies. The Saturn Stargate is essentially a planetary conjunctional coming together that was visible in the sky thousands of years ago. The planet Saturn, Venus and Mars came together culminating in a wormhole. Thousands of years ago the planets underwent a great upheaval. Saturn was much closer to Earth in the distant past. As Saturn, Venus and Mars traveled across the sky, they descended and aligned overhead Earth in a spectacular astronomical event called the Saturn Polar Configuration. As they aligned overhead, Earth, Mars descended and formed a mountain or pathway to Saturn and Venus. And this is called the keyhole symbol. And you'll be surprised how often this keyhole symbol appears in movies. The ramp um, leading to a portal that takes you to another world. Uh, we see it in the movie Passengers as well. So I've got a presentation that describes all this as well. The keyhole symbol. Now in the present, the present is filled with rectangles and it reminds me of the movie The Box. We live in a society today where everything is a box. Have you noticed? You look at a box at home. You sit in a box and you look at a box. You climb in a box that has wheels and you go to your office which is a box. Everything that we have today is a box because we are trapped in the matrix cube. And so the present is a box and they're everywhere. In the background you see these rectangles everywhere in the movie. Even the wall lights in the bathroom are rectangles. The book is a rectangle. Rectangles everywhere in the present. That's how you know you're in the present. The gift that Izzy gave to Tom, which is the pen and the ink, is in a rectangle, a box. Everything is a box. Yes, yes. And a little, a little circle in the middle, which is the way of escape inside the cube, the little thing in the middle. But everything is tied together with the circle. Now this is not natural light. This is supernatural light. This is the light of Shibalba. This is the light of enlightenment that penetrates all dimensions and all time. So there we see the rectangles all over the place, dominated by rectangles. Also the staircase at the museum, he walks up these stairs and in the Mayan temple he walks up the stairs, all right, as the ascension. Once again it's going from one dimension to a higher dimension to the Shibalba light on the top. The Ein Sof, the altogether nothingness that's at the top. The white light appears when the queen gives Tom his quest as well. When Izzy is about to die in the museum, you see the white light. The white light is telling her, your time is near, you're about to die. You're about to enter Shibalba. And she dies in the white light. She's always in the center because she is the tree and she is Shibalba and she is the queen. The light guides us and comforts us. The light is where we go when we die. Now, um, at one point, when he's operating on the monkey, he doesn't know, he can't find the cure. And then all of a sudden he looks up, remember that scene, he looks up, and he sees a square light on the roof, on the ceiling. And through the square light, he sees Shibalba. He sees Shibalba. And he's almost like enlightened at that point. This is what the great consciousness does. It enlightens us. It gives us answers at crucial times in our life. And he finds the cure. He says, what about that tree, that tree that came from South America? The cure is in the tree, and then he goes and gets it. And then the, the, the monkey Donovan starts to, uh, the age process starts to stop. Monitorium, retard. A passage with a light at the end is also the journey to Shibalba. She's going through to the other side. The light at the end of the tunnel, in other words. But there's squares everywhere in the present. In the present, there are squares all over the place. What is the monkey in? He's in a square. 
squares all over the place. You have the bathroom scene, we see everything is squares and rectangles. Also, the thing that holds the soap is a rectangle. The wall lights are rectangles. In the bedroom, everything is rectangle because this is the world of the cube. Yeah, in the, the laboratory, notice the circle is always center. That's why we have the circular shape in the center, which ties all the, the different time periods together. It must be quite clever for this director to have thought all this out eh, when making the movie. No, it's random. It's so random. There's no specific reason why it's in that order. No, no. The only thing that is sequentially placed is the circle. Always in the center, always tying the past, the present and the future together. There it is in the center. The circle shape is always in the center representing Shibalba. The future. Now in the future everything is spheres, everything is balls, everything is circles. Uh, the spherical shape and he's entering into Shibalba going up 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 and once again in the distant past on the map we see Shibalba appearing in the map the enlightenment comes that's why it goes bright like that enlightenment there's that thing that I was talking about in the roof in the ceiling the ceiling light actually it's snow falling on the glass and it looks like Shibalba to him now Izzy says it's beginning to snow there it is and what's it in it's a square light right? a square window looking out and it's Shibalba. Oh, that is the virus. That is under the microscope. When he looks into the microscope and finds the cure for Donovan, it's also Shibalba he's looking into the microscope. Okay, color is also used in this movie uh, to show certain things. Color is very important in movies because colors say things. And we have black and white, which is very strong in this movie. So what does black mean and what does white mean? Well, black represents fear and resistance of death. That's why Tom is always in black, because he resists death. Death is a disease, like any other, and I will find a cure, he says. Always in black, always resisting, not accepting. And Izzy, who completely accepts death and accepts her fate, she accepts death. And so she's always in white. White represents the acceptance of death. And the closer she gets to Shibalba, the more her garment begins to shine more. Her attire shines even brighter white. It also speaks of confidence and clarity. You noticed how peaceful Izzy is. She's at peace with herself. Whereas Tom is totally not at peace with himself. Constantly wrestling, fighting death. <clears throat> Izzy is always seen in white. confidence and clarity and Yari is in black the total opposite black clothes death and resistance there we see it contrasted between each other the white and the black the white and the black and when she dies everything is white 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 the acceptance and the embracing of death there in the room we see the white and the black again but now we also see uh, Tom wearing gray and what does grey mean? Well, grey is uh, the scientific, trying to understand death through science. That's the grey. Grey represents false confidence in science. You notice that Izzy is totally right brain. Tom is totally left brain. The scientific against the artistic. And this is playing out as well. So when he's wearing grey, it means confidence in science. False confidence in science. And so he's wearing grey all the time, false confidence, trying to find a cure. And then also, he's slowly changing now, Tom is changing. And as he's changing in the future, his acceptance of death, his clothes also change. From black to grey to white. And so at the end he's wearing white. White speaks of his acceptance of death and his achievements of apotheosis. <laughs> he's haunted by Izzy when he's travelling in his space bubble through the stars. He sees a spook all the time of Izzy coming to him and he struggles to come to grips with that. Then you have gold in the movie. The closer you get to Shibalba, Shibalba is all about gold. Gold, gold, gold. What does gold mean? Gold symbolizes the end of life and the beginning of new life. Creation, the beginning of new life. So the main controversy in the film centers on what to do about death. Tom continually rejects death, he sees death as a disease and he's on a quest to find a cure. 
Death is a disease like any other and there's a cure, a cure and I will find it, he says. Izzy accepts and embraces death. That's the main message in the movie. If you don't come away with anything else, you come away with that. Death is not the enemy, but a natural part of our humanity. Death is what makes us human. Death is what makes us human. Accepting death brings freedom and joy as we cease striving against death. Now, death is very depressive, all right? Death can be very soul destroying, but at the same time, death can also be very rewarding and, and opening up, liberating, because you're letting go. You're letting go of this world. Death is, a, is abolished when one accepts death. And that is the message at the heart of the form. It can be said that it is paradoxically the acceptance of death that engenders immorality. That's a paradox. The moment you accept death, then immortality comes. Then you receive immortality. Izzy undoubtedly has such an epiphany through the creation story. She understood that her death is a rebirth and not an end in itself. Liberation relieves her of all her fears and allows her to transcend her mortal, her mortal condition. The long passages in the movie, you get these long passages with a light at the end. Now that is the journey to Shibalba. We see the car riding on the, on the highway with the lights. The lights and the Shibalba, the city in the distance, the destination is Shibalba. Okay? So in every time period, he's traveling, he's on a path, he's on a journey towards Shibalba. In the distant past, he's riding a horse, okay, to Shibalba, the gold city at the end. That's what he's describing there, the path to the light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a light at the end. A journey from A to B. That is why the <coughs> ball is moving upwards, 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 through the stars to Shibalba at the end. It's moving up. And then also, did you see how the, the little bubble comes out of the big bubble? All right. Um, is in this big bubble, which is your body, your physical body. And as you go higher up, you leave. It's like load shedding. You shed things all the time. And part of the shedding is shedding your body. You shed your body to let go of the spirit and the soul, which ascend to higher, to higher dimensions. And that's what happened with the flowers. Releasing of the body. Upwards in a straight line, all the time. Okay, this Shibalba is very, very interesting. The Mayan underworld. That is so interesting. Shibalba is a golden nebula wrapped around a dying star. Shibalba is the mind's underworld. It's a place on earth, but it's also a place in the heavens. I started reading a bit on, oh, it's a, a very deep subject, the Mayan creation myth. Very complicated. You know, they make complicated stories. But when you break it down, it's actually quite mind-blowing. And it ties in with, with Christian creation story as well. There are strong parallels between the Christian creation story and the Mayan creation story. It's a place where the dead go to be reborn. It's the underworld. The Mayan underworld. And Izzy explains their creation myth. It explains their creation myth. You see, that first father, he's the very first human, like Adam. He sacrificed himself to make the world. The tree of life's bursting out of his belly. His body becomes the tree's roots. Okay, there's the Mayan, the Mayan tree, the tree of life. There it's bursting out of his stomach. They spread and formed the earth. His soul became the branches rising up from forming the sky. All that remained was first father's head, uh, Shibalba. His children hung it in the heavens, creating Shibalba, a golden nebula wrapped around a dying star. The whole universe birthed from the dying of a human being. So man is the universe, and the universe is man in a very real sense.
Shibalba is where life ends and begins. Shibalba is both a star and a location on earth. It's got to do with water as well. That's why there's this water on the pyramid, on the top of the pyramid. And also in the Garden of Eden you have the three, the four rivers flowing from the center, the navel of the, of the universe, the Garden of Eden. So him walking in the throne room towards the Queen, he's walking and it's the same spaceship story again. It's the bubble spaceship. All these lights are the stars and he's moving towards his Queen, moving towards Shibalba. The dark hallway represents space and the suspended candles are the many stars that Krios bubble passes. There we go, all the little stars in the sky. So the whole throne room is the journey to Shibalba. Him walking down this passage, there's one where he's walking up the passage as well. The lights are the stars and he's walking down the passage is this journey to Shibalba, the light at the end. Here's the stars again. You see, in every time period, it's the same journey. The same thing is happening all the time. Okay, just some other things I also found interesting about the movie. Queen is a representation of Shibalba and of the tree. She is the tree of life. Her whole garment has got roots and leaves and everything on it. And it's gold like, like Shibalba. Yes, yes, it's a, she is the tree of life. She's surrounded by the nebula, a dying star. The queen is dying because the inquisitor wants to kill her. Izzy is dying, but she's surrounded by stars, which is Shibalba, the dying star in the center of a nebula. It's in the center, the dying star, surrounded by the tree, but also surrounded by the stars. Eh? Beautiful. The Kabbalistic queen adorned in her tree dress, the tree of life dress. And then he comes into the circle and he kneels before the queen. Look at that, eh? This, the circle is Shibalba, the queen is the tree, and Tom kneels before her, the acceptance of death. The circular black and gold floor pattern, the two characters standing directly in the center symbolizing their bond on all three timelines. As they stand together in the black and gold circle, Black Thomas represents each version of himself. The Gold Queen is parallel to Izzy, the Tree of Life, Zebulba and the Dying Star. The Queen is an embodiment of the Tree of Life since the bottom of her dress contains black and gold root patterns. Her chamber door is also designed to look like golden leaves. When the Queen states Thomas's mission, Thomas is in black as he kneels in low lighting. Also the duvet in the present time when Izzy lies in bed, the duvet itself has got trees on it because Izzy is the tree of life the headboard as well. Did you pick all that up when you saw the movie? Yeah. But don't worry, your subconscious mind picks up all this stuff. There Tom is kneeling before her, the conquistador. My conquistador. And he's kneeling before the tree, just like he kneels before, before the queen. And he kneels before Izzy. Isn't that incredible? Constantly kneeling before Izzy. The kneeling before Izzy represents the acceptance of death. The tumor, the tumor in her brain, the queen and the concept of Shibalba represents Izzy because Tom's wife is dying of a brain tumor. It's a dying star. So Izzy is dying, but the queen is also dying because the inquisitor is after her. The attack on Spain uh, Tom says it's like a disease, a disease, a cancer, eating. The country of Spain also represents Izzy. When the Queen asks the conquistador why he cries, he replies this. To see Spain brought so low with an enemy thriving within her borders, feasting on her strength like a tumor. Remember the Queen is Spain. 
just like the Queen of England is England. If the Queen dies, England dies. If Spanish Queen dies, Spain dies. So they have to stop this. So the Tom in the past is also fighting the disease, just like the doctor is fighting a disease. You see that? So Spain's tumor is the inquisitor, and Izzy's inquisitor is her tumor. You must cut out the cancer of Spain. Okay, this is beautiful. The climbing of the tree. Remember in his bubble? Everything floats, and there's no gravity, so he floats and he climbs up the tree. Did you see him climbing that tree? That's climbing the tree of life, the, the Kabbalistic tree in the Jewish mysticism. Climbing the tree of life. And we are all climbing the tree of life. We begin at the bottom of the tree at kingdom and we climb up these seraphims. We climb up to crown at the top and even beyond to Ein Sof, the altogether nothingness. Climbing the tree of life from lower dimension to higher dimension. We are ascending. You don't have to be caught in the trap of reincarnation. You can ascend to the higher parts of the tree, the Jacob's ladder. You can get to the top. There he's climbing the tree. My heart, I, I felt something inside me when I saw him climbing the tree. I said, but this guy's climbing the tree of life. He's climbing to higher dimensions. The more enlightened one becomes, the higher up the tree you climb, coming out of the bubble. Letting go of lower dimensions. Letting go. Buddhism is all about letting go. Buddhism is all about load shedding. Getting rid of. Getting rid of. Becoming lighter. Uh, not being bound by the lower density of this world. Leaving the physical body. The spirit leaving the body. Okay? The higher up you go, the more of yourself you let go. And eventually you actually lose individuality. It's hard to understand that. But the higher up you go, the less individuality you have. Because you become one with the universe. But we aren't there yet. Our brains are too small to grasp. How can you exist without individuality? I'm me. I'm Ian Dobson. Must I give up Ian Dobson? Yeah, you have to give up Ian Dobson. Lose the personality. Okay, okay, lose your personality. Okay. Yeah, the personality. What remains after everything dies? What of you remains after everything dies? He's wearing the ring. Oh, this ring story. He's forever losing the flippin' ring. He can't get this ring. In the bath, Izzy asked, where's your ring? No, I lost it. I lost the ring. See, he's losing the ring is his unacceptance of death. When he finds the ring, it's acceptance of death. And yeah, as he moves up, he now has the ring. Because he's at peace with himself. He's at peace with the universe. And he's accepted death. And what death means. So now he enters Ein Sof. Becoming one with the universe. Death is the road to all. Out of destruction comes creation. And so this explosion takes place. And that's what the universe is. The universe, even science teaches us that the universe is expanding and contracting all the time. It's like breathing. The universe breathes. And we die. When the universe contracts, we die. We die, we die, we die. Remember that thing went down, down, down until the total blackness. Okay? And then he kept like two seconds, three seconds, silence. And then all of a sudden, whoa, massive explosion. That's the universe expanding again to, into newness of life. And so he dies with Shibalba. And he's born into newness newness of lion the reason for this arch is once again mayan because the tree explodes from the navel uh, of the god who dies the god who gives his life so that a new universe can be born you are the universe and you die and explode into new life so the universe explodes into newness of life and the tree begins to grow again the dead tree explodes into a new tree. The cycle of the universe, the universe expands and then contracts only to expand again. It's the born again experience. Him eating the tree is a symbol of communion. If you eat of me, you shall live forever. And so he takes the, the tree of life, the body of Christ, he eats it 
and in him eating of the tree he receives eternal life so this is the whole communion thing playing out over there as well he who eats of me my flesh and drinks of my body the first father will live forever it's amazing how the different religions aren't in competition with each other they aren't saying things that are different all religions are saying the same thing the cross comes up often in the movie as well in the lift there's a cross in the lift and tom looks at the cross so the director makes you realize that tom is looking at the cross in the lift when Izzy exits and literally exits this is the last time that he sees her alive is she's leaving she's leaving this earth and where is she going the light at the end of the tunnel but guess what it's making it's making the shape of a cross cross the cross symbolism is there there it is amazing amazing the gate of Eden now we have that whole story where he's confronted with the God who's protecting the tree of life, just like in Genesis, the angel that protects the tree of life, that no man may go beyond this point. It's a Mayan thing as well. The sword, the flaming sword. So God drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way. Some say that flaming sword turning every way is a portal. It's actually a portal to keep the way of the tree of life. And the director actually puts it in the movie himself. And then the Mayan says these words, death is the road to all. Then he says to the first father, Tom, forgive me, he says, first father, I did not know it was you. We shall be immortal, he says. Our blood shall feed the earth. And then Tom kills the God and his blood falls in to the ground. Death is the road to all. The acceptance of death opens to liberation and eternity. So he's transcended time now and so Tom comes back to the past because he has eaten of the tree and he is now the first father. He has become a god, apotheosis, and in him becoming a god, the god bows down and worships him as a god. The Merkaba, the, the machine that you go up in, the, the, the little device that you travel in, this shape that he's making is the shape of the Merkaba. All right? that's, where, that's how you sit when you sit in the Merkaba. It is a transportation device that takes you to higher dimensions. So him in that circle is his little Merkaba, his traveling device. There we go. There's the Merkaba. It's a, a hexagram shape. One up, one down. Triangle up, triangle down that makes the Merkaba. Travels. He travels up in this, in this device. The traveling device. The device that enables you to leave this world and go beyond it. An interdimensional transportation device. So this director knew all this. He knew all this knowledge when he made the movie. It's incredible the amount of knowledge these directors have in making these movies. The tree of life, the tree of life is the metaphysical structure of creation in Kabbalism, in Jewish mysticism. It's the, the ten serifots, the emanations that ascend. It is the spiritual path of ascension. It is the map of creation, the map of creation, how God made the world, the tree of knowledge and of life. So here it is. This is the circle that I was talking about. 
It starts at the top. God, God who wants to experience, it's all about experience. God wants to experience life. And so he comes down in the form of man to experience. So he starts up there in the Ein Sof. Pure energy. Before this matter, there's pure energy. And then it drops down. It drops down. So energy takes on matter. Energy takes on matter. That's what 3D is all about. We're living in this matter world. As energy slows down, it takes on matter. It takes on mass and becomes matter. Then at the end of time, once you've done your cycle, then you go up again. You go up. That's the circle of life. Okay? This is death. This is death. Death is the road to all. And you, from matter, you ascend back to energy. And now, different names are given over here. You can say that it's kingdom and it's crown in the tree of life. You can say that it's spirit at the top and flesh at the bottom. When you take, when you load shed your flesh, you become spirit. You can say the infinite, there's no time and it's forever, but down here it's finite. Yeah, it's black and white, it's finite. There's an end to it. Up there it's timeless. Now we are trapped in time, the illusion, the illusion of time. So that's the circle. The circle of life down here it's 3d but up there it's beyond it's not 4d because 4d has got to do with time so it's beyond 4d it's 5d and and beyond it goes up 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 seriously yeah okay the rings the concentric rings of a tree the cyclical nature of the universe the tattoos on tom's arm indicate the passage of time we almost finished all these rings, eh? All over the place. The pen he's writing with is the very same pen he's writing with in the bubble. It's the same pen. But now it's all broken and old. See there? It's exactly the same pen. So it gives you this sense of, of time going past. 500 years going past. So he comes up with this bright idea. I keep losing my ring, so let me tattoo the ring on. That I don't lose the ring ever again. <coughs> Forever losing his ring. Losing the ring symbolizes the fact that Tom fails, loses to save Izzy. A ring symbolizes the endless nature of love. The inability to put the ring on shows that man's desire to make things everlasting will always be flummoxed by the ephemeral nature of man's existence. You lost it in the past, you find it in the future. Future Tom recovers the ring that past Tom lost. Tom now no longer fights the inevitableness of death. He loses this ring all the time and then he finally gets it. He gets the ring at the end. He earns the ring. But he understands now that death is important. The importance of death. He earns the ring when he accepts Izzy's death and closes the circle. Tom becomes the first father, Adam. And Izzy becomes the first woman, Eve. So all three Toms have a single purpose, to preserve the life of their dying loved ones. Tom of Spain must find the tree of life in order to save Spain and rescue the queen. Tom the doctor must find a cure to save his dying wife, Izzy. An Astro Tom must keep the tree in his bubble alive long enough to reach the dying star so that he can save Izzy. All three Toms are consumed by their quest to find a cure. All three Toms eventually cease from fighting death and accept and embrace death. All three Toms are consumed by this one single purpose. Uh, all three Toms reach apotheosis in the end to become a god and reach a state of enlightenment. So the acceptance of death is necessary for living a full life. And then I said, all things come to an end, and that is sad. But all things start again, and that is good. Thanks, people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Let's go.